What's up guys, it's time for our next video. This time we are going to talk about the endgame priorities again and uh, it's going, we are going to see something similar to the previous example from the previous lecture from the game between Mikitarian as Black versus Gawain Jones. This time we have two even stronger Grandmasters, at least by rating, than them. Uh, we have Boris Gelfand playing his white against uh, Nils Grandelius from Sweden. It's also the Olympiad. Um, and this was one of the most spectacular games ever. If you, if you can uh, analyze it, if you can have a look at it, that will be really awesome. But I just wanted to show you the end game part of it. And uh, this is coming just to, uh, to, to add up to the knowledge that we got from the priorities from the previous video. And now, uh, as I told you, in the end games, the pawns are very valuable and they can be, uh, since any of them can become a queen. And this one is not an exception here. The three pawns that Grandelius has are way more important than the knight that Gelfand has. This is not middle game, this is end game. Even if Black somehow loses all the pawns, he is not risking to lose this one. But with the pawns especially um, spread it all over all over the, the place like it is here. He has an H pawn and he has an A pawn. These are the most unpleasant pawns for the knight. It's extremely difficult for Gelfand to defend us. And it's funny that roughly a year ago he lost a similar endgame. Uh, knight versus three pawns versus Rajabov and uh, here too. Uh, here neither he could save himself. Uh, at first he played quite well actually, he played rook a6 and on king e7 he jumped with the knight on e3 uh, which was uh, the right thing to do so he needs to somehow to coordinate his pieces if he wants to fight those pawns and he shouldn't go pawn grabbing because for example if he goes rook h6 and he goes for that h7 pawn the a and the p pawns will go forward and they will become queens, nobody will be able to stop them. And notice how the short range pieces, the king and the knight, are too far away from the pawns on the queen side and they can never ever really stop them. They need loads of moves, they need hundreds of moves to get there. So this king will have to move away from the pin and this knight somehow and for that time black will go of course b3, rook b1, and a1, he will take the rook. So that's why he is uh, bringing the knight to the central square, he's bringing the knight closer to the queen side pawns, uh, and after 95, he's improving his chances to go for a draw. But here, for some reason, Gilfant um, obviously couldn't find any more reliable setup than this one. But he said that he sent the rook back to defend the pawn from in front. I think that the computer suggestion, and that's only a computer that finds it, would be more to the point. Rook a5 looks a little bit illogical even though it is creating the threat knight c3 to take one of the pawns as it uh, forces the king to go to uh, b7 but it turns out that after knight f4 uh, the white pieces are quite well coordinated and uh, the pawns are not making a move. None of them is making a move, neither does nor that and if king to b6 there is rook a8 and again none of the pawns is making moves and after say rook b3, which is already attempting the move a3, uh, white can do king f2 and on a3 he can send the king to the queen side. So he's getting some time for the short range piece to come and to stop the two pawns, the king in that case. And on the other side the knight is somehow taming the h pawn. So this is a very good uh, way of distributing the forces that we have, the remaining uh, pieces. King and the rook on one side, the knight on the other side, and everybody is doing the things the way that they should be doing it. And that's one of the things that you should be always aiming for in the end games: distribution of the roles, especially if you're fighting pawns. Um, sometimes, if it was, for example, an end game king and knight versus king and two pawns, sometimes one of the pieces will have to take care of one of the pawn and the other one to take care of the other pawn. Uh, especially with the knight, this distribution is extremely important, but with the other pieces, that's not an exception. Um, very often, you just need to have them in particular way, in particular, um, you need to set them up in particular fashion so that you stop the passers. And that should be your priority. Gelfon goes rook c6 check, and after king b8, he did rook c3. And probably here um, there was also a mistake by small mistake by Black as he is 
um, he is going h5, which is actually quite a logical move. I wouldn't even call it a mistake. I think it's more like an inaccuracy. And it would have been way better if he had gone king to b7. Uh, so that after rook c7 check and king k6 and rook c6 check, please note that this pawn is still invincible as uh, in that case there is king b7 and the king will go to c6 and only after that uh, black will take the knight and uh, win this endgame as the king is still too far away, the white king. Uh, so only after uh, rook c6 check it becomes... Actually it's not yet obvious that this is a loss for white as he has the move rook c8 and he's threatening checkmate. Uh, but then white I think would be having a very hard time defending against these passers which are moving and to me black should have tried to push the pawns on the queen side he is way stronger there way way stronger there these are his main assets and he didn't even need to deflect this king or the knight they are already far away okay the king is far away the knight not that far away uh, but still the king and the two pawns and the rook can deal with the rook and the knight in my opinion so it was better just to send the king there help the pawns go forward and that should have won the game h5 on the other hand is not such a bad move uh, and it's still posing white lots of problems that he couldn't solve especially with the limited time on his clock uh, please note that there was also a move like rook a3 which is threatening knight c3 and after that to sacrifice the knight for the two pawns either this way or that way but in that case there would be the move rook to b3 and that's another class another lesson from from this video that you should try to apply in your games whenever you can if you are playing in game where the pawns are facing a light piece and there are major pieces on the board, always try to trade the major pieces as the major pieces are the long range pieces and they can easily stop the pawns on either side and uh, also bishops, try to trade bishops try to leave to the opponent only the short range pieces because the short range pieces, like it is here after rook b3 and e b3 um, they can be easily separated and they can be easily defeated by um, the remaining forces that we have. For example, knight c3, b2, king g2. Yes, we're going to lose the h pawn, but in the process, we are going to uh, get our king into the action, into the game, and then just march and take that knight for free. And the remaining pawn, or maybe both the remaining pawns, will become queens. Uh, and on rook b3, if they do rook a1, then the pawns are making moves. They are marching and that should be one for black. So that's why king f1. So Gelfont is feeling that he needs the king on the queen side and he's sending it there. Uh, but Grandelius is trying to deflect him. And next uh, he played king b7 finally bringing the king into the game. But there was a more direct play uh, for the win with the move rook b3 when after rook takes h4 and a3 and the check black is winning although he has to be careful after this check he has to be careful where exactly is he going with the king actually he has to bypass two very strong traps first trap logically we want to go to a6 so that there is no rook behind the pawn and if rook is coming on h1 there will be a rook b1 however here after the check in king a5 there comes the move rook to h8 and that's a meeting threat it's not a joke it's a real meeting threat and uh, black will have to go rook b to check first to defend the pawn and then go b4 but this is where um, after king b5 we will get a study like position where if you remember the priorities the knight can sacrifice itself for the pawns and it can sacrifice itself for the pawns with the move knight c3 check and that's a very good trade of a knight for almost two queens after all these two pawns they are almost there after a pawn takes and king c3, rook anywhere and king b3, the pawns are gone and the point is split. Uh, so therefore the king has to go to c6, not on a6, but to c6. 
and then after rook a7 there will be king d5 and that's the second trap that black needed to avoid as normally it's very tempting to try and to keep both the pawns alive with a move like rook b2 first check and then to take on d5 but surprisingly the arising position is going to be a draw as the pawns are separated and they cannot unite their efforts without losing each other king b3 might have also been a draw too so that's that's a, again another another split point but king d5 on the other hand would be good enough for him uh, to make to win the, this game as black as this king is not optimally placed that's a threat and uh, the king will never make it in front of the pawn if the king makes it in front of the pawn okay then there will be a draw even if he's on a on a passive defense even if he's forced on a passive defense but it will never get there so back to the game king b7 played king e1 king c6 and finally i suspect in time travel i wasn't there i couldn't really see it uh, Gelfand cracked under pressure, he played the move knight c3 and after e3 followed by b4 these pawns were unstoppable and um, he resigned after losing the knight just on the next move uh, but that's not everything actually there was a way out there was a way out which is again it again has something to do with the priorities we said that the short range pieces they don't have so much speed and every tempo counts any tempo counts so here white had to win a tempo not with the move knight c3 but with the move knight e7 check and once that this tempo is won uh, white will have a chance to sneak in with the king and to come a little bit closer just close enough to stop the pawns for example b4 king c1 and e3 they can go that far only now rook h4 this pawn is not that important it's important from the perspective that we want to get rid of it and after that concentrate on the queen side but we can take it anytime that we want and on b3 there goes rook h5 check now we have to be careful still but apparently that should be a draw for instance if the king comes on d6 to attack our knight we can give a check and another check with the knight coming on e3 it's very important that we are always controlling the c2 square uh, as otherwise black is threatening to go rook c2 check himself followed by e2 check followed by rook c1 check and then to promote everything is coming with checks and after king e4 if you remember the priorities were to take the pawns so we go for the pawns we don't really care about the knight he is also having his own priorities to defend the pawns but then rook b5 and we constantly attack the pawns to the left to the right until we take one of them also in case that you were uh, that you were wondering uh, what will happen if he doesn't go king to d6 what will happen if he goes with the king c to c4 or any other square then we can give a lot of checks with our rook a lot of annoying checks until this king goes far away it has to approach our rook and now that the king is separated from the remaining uh, forces we can do rook c3 and again it's very important to defend that square it's mandatory and that should be also a draw next we can start bringing our knight closer maybe knight c6 knight a5 or knight um, c6 knight d4 we will take pawn number one and without it there is nothing to worry about so once more it's about priorities and the lessons from this game for us are that whenever we have short range pieces we should try to distribute them in the in the right way and not only short range pieces but whenever we are playing with a piece versus the pass we're always looking for the good distribution of the forces um, so that the stronger piece is stopping the really dangerous passers and the weaker piece is left to defend the less dangerous ones or one the other thing is we are looking for ways as usual to sacrifice the knight for the pawns or at least for a couple of them and try to reach some theoretically draw position and if we are on the stronger side if we're having um, the pawns then we are looking for ways to get rid of the major pieces 
and that will make it easier for us to push the pulse especially if the pulse is spread over all over the place on both the flanks this will make it even more difficult for the opponent especially if they have um, short range pieces like the knight together with the king so that will be it for today thanks again for watching this and i'll see you next time take care